I'm Megan Gillia. I am a paracyclist for the Great British Cycling Team. I am the Paralympian of Rio 2016, or a Paralympian, should I say, of Rio 2016. And I have my stroke at the age of 27. And at this present time, I am 33 years old. Around the time of my stroke, it was kind of a normal day really. I was at work at the office, at an office desk. I'm not really an office worker, but it just so happened I had to go and do some tra uh, paperwork bits and bobs. And I fainted. Um, coming down from some stairs, I fainted against the stairs. And the following morning, I woke up and I had a complete bloodshot eye. And I suddenly noticed I had really bad headaches and a stiff neck. And I didn't think anything of it, but I was told, you know what, you better go to hospital and just get checked out because it's not like me to faint. I, the only time I have fainted as such is actually being knocked out in rugby. So I walked into A&E thinking I was going to get sent home with migraines. And lo and behold, I was there for four days in total, having various scans and MRIs and other tests done to me, being prodded and poked. And they diagnosed me with what's called a subacnoid brain hemorrhage, so I had a bleed on the brain. Um, because of the haemorrhage, I was left with a variety of um, complications. So I've got neurofatigue, which is the bog standard for anyone that's suffered a stroke of any sh shape or form, they have fatigue, end of. And it is a killer, you know, you start your day with half a battery pretty much and it zomps, it's gone by the end of the day and you're in bed tucked up early. Um, and if you try and argue it and try to ignore it, you normally end up in bed anyway, whether you like it or not, kicking and stomping. Um, but alongside the fatigue, I had right side hemiplegia, which as you can tell, I can move my right side now, but there is a delay in the responses, so my grip, isn't, my grip strength is minimalised in my, in my right side. I have drop foot, so my foot literally drops at the ankle and doesn't do anything. It's uh, what they call flaccid, so it just kind of like hangs there, unless suddenly something, someone jabs me or tickles me or comes out, out of the blue and then suddenly I'm rigid. I'm as straight as a ruler and my whole body's in tow. Um, I've got memory issues, so I suffer with what's called confabulations and basically where I lost my memory is put in false memories. So I believe I've got three brothers and three sisters, I actually have one brother and three sisters. So I had to mourn two brothers which weren't even real. Um, and I thought I was a vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian so I do eat meat. But also for performance value, uh, meat is um, part of my diet so I have to overcome that and every time I eat meat I have a struggle with actually I'm a vegetarian I shouldn't be eating this. Um, I have um, the general coordination issues um, but I also suffer with speech impairment which comes and goes with fatigue relate related, epilepsy and there is also swallowing issues so I have a muscle in the back of my throat which has been shut off and basically doesn't shut off so effectively I can swallow my food down the wrong hole and cough and splutter and then a little bit of na nasal regurgitation on a date you know with my partner and out it comes of the nose. <laughs> Recovery for me has been a massive journey and even now, nearly six years on, I'm still recovering. It's smaller steps now, but it's, it's a lot, when you do see it, you notice it massively. In the very early stages, my recovery was quite quick, um, but there was massive flaws. And what I used for my recovery was my bike. My bike was my life, it was, it was my focus, it gave me, it gave me independence. And I used that, I tied my hand to the handlebar, my foot was tied to the pedal, and I used that to get the movement going. And that's, I think that is part of the reason why I have the movement I do have. Along with my attitude, you know, I've got, I like to think I've got a very positive attitude. PMI, it's all about the positive mental attitude. Um, and I just, I believe that with that positive thought and then that, that action to actually want to do, that helps with my success. And, you know, for everyone, I think you have to find something and you have to use it to your advantage to help you recover. You know, you, you're mourning yourself and you have to find a new you. So try something new and you know what, if you don't like it, try something different. But you'll find something that will help motivate you and help encourage you and help you recover in your own way. I got involved with the Paralympics actually by chance. I was diagnosed six months after my stroke with epilepsy. And when I was diagnosed, all of a sudden my world came crashing down. I couldn't cope anymore because it was one thing after another that was wrong with me. And I got on a bike, I tied my hand to the handlebar, I tied my foot to the pedal, and I cycled basically 120 miles one direction. I probably got lost a few times on the way, but I arrived in Cambridge where my friend was. And it was there that I got motivated into cycling. I met my friend's mum, Karen. Karen, and she is a fantastic woman. And she gave me this massive speech because I was feeling, I was down in the dumps, I was feeling sorry for myself and I didn't know what to do. I, I, just, I just thought there was nothing for me anymore. I was always very sporty and active. And she said, Megan, I want to give you a mission. I want you to find a sport and be the best you can be in it. No matter what that is, whether it's club level, whether it's at the top of your game, just be the best you can be in it and be happy. And what really hit 
home and actually drove me for that success was that she actually knew she had terminal cancer at that moment. And it wasn't long after, it was about three months after that she actually passed away. But knowing that she was still living her life, still trying to enjoy the moment she did, and yes, she had real down days, but she still enjoyed her life. It made me realise that actually I had a second chance and I should honour that. And that's how, I, that's how the journey began really. And effectively I ended up on a bike because I cycled 120 mi miles. And I was like, why don't I try cycling? So I applied, went through the rigmarole of applying and dying each night after trying a bit of training and needing to sleep. And eventually I got to where I needed to be and I ended up in Rio. But it was, it, was a, it was a long way off. I didn't even think I was going to make it to Rio. I wasn't even thinking that. I was just thinking day by day, just enjoying it. And that's what mattered. But at Rio, I was the first um, Paralympian to win a gold medal. Uh, it was on the first day of the Paralympics. And when I won it, to be fair, it was completely overwhelming. I, I didn't know, but actually I went in as um, favourite to win gold, but I didn't know that. All I knew is that I wanted to, I wanted to make a difference. So every ride I do, every, ma every major event I do, I dedicate it to someone else that suffered a stroke or even cancer, all the different, you know, there are so many ailments out there that affect people in so many different ways. And I wanted to raise that awareness a little bit. And also, I kind of cringe when I go onto a podium and receive a medal, because to me, I, I don't want to be on there. I just want to ride my bike. So by dedicating it to someone, it was taking that limelight from me and putting it onto someone else. And for my first gold, I won, uh, I won it and dedicated it to a young lad called Alistair Rowan, who also suffered a very similar um, stroke to myself at the age of 10, at literally about a month, two months before I went to Rio. And it was amazing the impact it had and the effect because, you know, it made it to, it, it went viral, it went to the papers and everything. And his family were getting notifications and people wanted to contact them. And he was going into school and signing his autograph for his friends. And it was just fantastic to know that actually I've given a little bit back to someone else that needed that moment. You know, that little lad at that moment was lost, didn't know whether he was going to play football again or cricket or anything. And he just wanted to be, be playing sports. And his family were obviously didn't know what, what lay ahead for him and were scared stiff, you know, as their little boy. And just to give that back and give them a different focus was amazing. Different strokes, I actually um, got involved with before I started Rio. Um, I, I, fell, I fell into different strokes by chance and it was a matter of I contacted them because I was after some contacts but I don't think it was for myself, I can't fully remember. But I went along, they invited me along to an event that was being held in London, it was like a little stroke award thing and a, a meeting and such, a conference and such. And I went along there and they just said, look, would you like to be a patron? I said, but I'm not a, really anyone at the moment, you know, I just cycle, I'm kind of on the team but I've not actually got you know, there's no, there's no guarantee that I'm going to win a gold medal. They're going, but you are a great role model. So I came along and you said, I would love to be a patron because you know what, if it makes that little bit of a difference in some way, shape or form, then I'm up for it. And that's kind of how it began. And then from then on, I've kind of just, wherever I can, I just give a little bit of my time. You know, that little bit of time can make a difference to even one person. So within different strokes, one of the key, key things that stuck out to me is that it was, it was run by stroke survivors and young stroke survivors as such. And it was volunteers, it was stroke survivors, helping other stroke survivors. It's a massive community. And when I got in a room with so many people, I suddenly realized you could relate to individuals at in different levels. So while some suffered chronically with fatigue, others suffered massively with their phys physical ability to not do things or do things and how they did that. But it was amazing that you could just give a little tip here and there, what I have tried. And just by sharing those experiences, it just suddenly made you not feel so by yourself at that time, especially especially the early stages of when you've had a stroke, it's then because you feel lost, you've got to find yourself, you've got to, you don't feel like you fit in and belong. And it gives you that little sense of being and not being judged, but actually just being accepted for who you are. And that gives you the strength to then go on and build yourself up again. So yes, I'm taking part in an abseil today. This was very much because of my partner, Tony. She, um, she magically signed me up for it unawares. And yeah, I'm here doing it. Now, I'm always up for an adrenaline field, to be fair. But um, I didn't realise the building we were doing a hover. I thought I was going to have a nice solid wall to jump down. It's like, yes, I can look like Tarzan or King Kong or whatever coming down this building. And I suddenly realised I'm just in thin air. And I have no idea. I think my best bit of advice for a younger survivor is, especially if you're in the early recovery, early stages, is in order to move forward, you need to accept what's happened. But you need to try new things. You need to be, 
you need to be around positive experiences and positive people and a positive environment because if you get it drawn into the negativity, it brings you down. We've all been there, we have highs and lows, and there's nothing wrong with having a low day, but it's being able to accept that's happened and then move on to the next day and start it afresh. You've got to try new things and find something that makes you feel alive again. Find yourself. I call myself Megan the Second because that stroke has given me a chance to redefine myself and find myself again. And you do change after a life-changing experience and you've got, to, you've got to kind of embrace it and accept what's happened and begin living life day by day. For me, future-wise, so obviously I've been, been, been and done Rio. Um, I'm still on the com uh, competing as a cyclist. Um, I have some local World Cup events um, coming up in January 20, what year are we in? 2018, so yeah, 2019. Um, however, I am I'm obviously looking at the bigger picture and aiming for Tokyo 2020, so hopefully you'll see me on the screen at some point soon.